Stanford University. Welcome to E380, uh, winter quarter 2008-2009. Um, we realize there are some problems with the tape delayed uh, versions of the class. We're working on them. However, think of it as an incentive to show up. Um, next, week is, next week's talk is about the great disturbance in the force when a billion spams were snuffed out about a month or so ago. Uh, it wasn't an accident. There was definitely somebody to blame, and they're going to talk. Uh, nobody ever sticks up for spam. I thought I would. Okay. Today's talk is a wheel of reincarnation talk. In the beginning, being in the computer business meant you had to do it all. To, at various points in time, though, today's speaker pointed out that there are things that computers should, computer companies shouldn't do, such as make computers. Um, that's not to say that he's hostile te to technology, because he's started and funded more than his share of companies that make computer technology, or make computers, or associated tools. However, things continue to change, and now he's arguing that some things have to come back under the same roof for the technology to work. Andy Rappaport, which, who, is given, who gave the talk about computerless computer company to EE380, probably to his surprise, has become a gray bird in the VC community. I'll bet he never thought it would happen. Andy Rappaport. Oh, August Capital, we might as well give him a pitch. They're one of the good guys. Right. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. And yes, I never thought I'd be a gray beard at all, let alone in the venture capital community. I was describing a, one of my companies this morning to an old friend of mine at Intel, actually. And I said that this is a very odd company because it's the first time in a long time I invested in a founding team where every founder was older than me, uh, which these days almost never happens and almost is always disqualifying. Um, so I do recall that uh, I think a couple of talks ago for this, uh, for this class, and, and I think we're going back now to probably 2001, I gave a talk about why the venture capital business wasn't dead after the crash. So I wonder whether I'll be invited back to give that talk the next time after this current crash. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are some changes in the semiconductor industry that I think are going to be fairly fundamental and will be with us for some time. Um, I like the notion of Wheel of Reincarnation. That's very much what it's about. The underlying theme of this talk, if you want to get up and leave now, is that if you think you know where value is, wait a few years and you'll be wrong. Uh, and so let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, one thing to point out, the slides here say January 2009. So I updated this presentation. This is based on a presentation I gave in April of 2008. And I updated it last night for this talk. I've given it several times since without updating it. Uh, I updated it last night by changing the date on the title slide to January 2009. And all the footers, this took me a while to figure out how to do. But I changed all the footers, uh, now say January 2009 instead of April 2008. In every other respect, the talk is identical, or slides anyway, are identical to the original ones I created in April. And this isn't because I didn't want to update it, but because the parts I would have updated are data about the financial markets. And my thought when, when um, uh, Dennis and Andy asked me if I would come in today and do this is, well, this is a great opportunity for me to update the financial numbers to reflect what's changed since April of 2008, because a lot has changed in the financial markets since April of 2008. But as I thought about doing that, and I looked at the slides, I realized that it would undermine the presentation because the numbers I'm going to show you are stark and startling, and they were stark and startling before the markets crashed. So think back to April of 2008. So the Dow peaked in October of 2007. April of 2008, we were a little worried things were looking weak, but the wheels hadn't uh, fallen off the bus. And of course, now we know that, that things are a lot more serious than we thought. And so what I realized is that, it, that, that the presentation is actually sharper using the April data today than it would be using today's data today. Um, and so I have left it the way it is. But you know, nonetheless, I wanted to do some specific work for the class other than finding a dongle for my Mac. So I updated the dates on the foils. All right, so um, 
Let me talk about my job. There's a foil in here that I skipped over about uh, semiconductor companies I've been involved with. I've done a bunch of, of semiconductor companies as a founder, as an investor, dating back now uh, almost 25 years uh, to before the fabulous semiconductor era. So I've seen a lot and been controversial in my observations about the semiconductor business, uh, and am apparently so once again. Um, but here is my job now. My job now is to outperform the markets as a whole and my peers. And if you look at this chart about venture capital returns, there are a few interesting things to observe. Um, the most important characteristic here is to look at the yellow curve, which is the return for venture capitalists in the upper quartile, the top quarter of all funds versus the gray curve, which is the curve for venture capitalists in the lower quartile, and of course the brown curve, which is the S&P. So my job is to invest in things that not only outperform the S&P over time, but will outperform my peers, uh, because that's how you know, I uh, uh, provide returns to my limited partners and attract capital into our funds. So the things to look at here are, first of all, the difference between the upper quartile and lower quartile returns are stark, right? And so what that implies is that most of the money that gets made in the venture capital business gets made on a relatively small number of investments that are clustered in a small number of firms, and everybody else struggles to stay above the S&P. The other thing that you've probably noticed is that the lower quartile is below the S&P most of the time right, uh, which is interesting by itself. And even the upper quartile was below the S&P for the last uh, quote unquote vintage year that I, that I uh, uh, illustrated here, 2006. I wouldn't read too much into that because venture capital funds go through a J curve where you put the money out for a while and it doesn't look so good. And then after a while, the good companies start to, start to make you money. But basically, my lens into the world now is you know, how do I do that? How do I stay on that yellow curve? And of course, you can translate that to any professional pursuit. How do I stay at the top of my game? So what is venture capital? And how does that influence how I think about things? So this is the secret of venture capital. Buy low, sell high. No problem. Okay, you do that, you do pretty well. But we want to do that where perceived risk is greater than actual risk. So this is really how I get paid, where uh, we get paid to spot things that look very risky to the world at large, but by doing a lot of work, by bringing some experience to the table, by being willing to remain illiquid for a while, uh, we can actually sort to things that have less risk than they are generally perceived to have, and that's where we get our premium. And importantly, and this is a main theme of this talk, to do so where our cost rounds to zero relative to the eventual outcome, right? So most of the money in venture capital gets made in investments that have a high enough multiple return that the amount you make is a huge, huge um, multiple of the amount you put in. Uh, and so not very many of those have to work out terrifically well to compensate for the ones that don't, because in the ones that don't, all you're losing is the amount you invested, which is a very small fraction of that. And so basically, this is option economics, right? This is not equity economics. I'm buying an option on something which has disproportionately large value because its actual risk is less than its generally perceived risk. That's very important, and you'll see why as I go through this talk. So venture capital industry has gone completely crazy. Um, in, on this slide, what I've illustrated is the total amount of money raised by venture firms uh, in the U.S. by year from 1981 through to 2006, which was the last, actually there is 2007 data there. And you can see that it was kind of bubbling along at a level that interestingly rounded to zero, at least scaled to this chart until the mid-1990s, and then all of a sudden venture capital became a widely desired asset class, and that's a whole separate talk, but a huge amount of money started flowing into uh, venture capital and other alternative investment classes, uh, to the point where in the peak year 2000, uh, over $100 billion was raised by, by venture funds. And what's, what's interesting is in 1999, 
uh, the amount of money that was raised, and you can read this data off the chart, uh, exceeded the amount of money put into, in that single year, 1999, exceeded the amount of money put into venture, U.S. venture capital through the entire history of United States venture capital. And then in 2000, there was an even larger number. So you think about the age of the money in the system, it's quite young. Uh, then we went through the crash and new investments in venture capital fell, but you can see that, that at least through 2007, it drifted back up. So you've probably also seen the other trend, which uh, is superimposed here, which is what have the returns of venture capital in the United States been over that period? And the answer is that if you look at the regression, they've been dropping, right? Uh, so a huge amount of money has gone in, but as a function of that huge amount of money going in, the average returns have dropped pretty substantially, and they've dropped to the point where, for the later years uh, in 2000, the ap average return of U.S. venture capital is negative. As an industry, on average, we've been losing money for uh, pretty much this entire decade. And I think, on average, that will continue. And my argument for why this is true, yeah? Are the dates on the returns uh, time shifted from the dates? I mean, in other words, when you put the money in, there's many years that go by before you know Well, I would argue that right now, when you put the money in, you know the return. But yes, you're right. So, uh, no, actually on this chart, I apologize, no, this is uh, by vintage year. So these are, these are the returns for, so the way venture funds are raised is they are, have what are called vintages. The funds are committed in a particular year and those funds are then measured uh, uh, against one another in the, uh, 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 normalized to the year in which they were raised. So, so in this case, these numbers are not time shifted. Yes. So five years from now, this data would, so what would happen here is that the data up to probably 2001, 2002, 2003 wouldn't move very much at all because it's IRR data and the IRRs are pretty much fixed. Something very dramatic would have to happen on the upside for the IRRs to change. Yes. It could, but once you're, once you're uh, probably four or five years out from the vintage, it's hard for it to change by much. So, um, but the relationship has been, uh, the relationship has been, uh, 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 I think will, will remain the case, which is that, you know, as long as uh, the amount of money in the system is very high, uh, it's hard to envision how the returns go up unless we think that there are going to be a lot more good ideas. Right? But my argument about venture capital, and we'll go through why is this relevant to the semiconductor industry, et cetera, is that the, the number and quality of good ideas doesn't necessarily scale with the number of dollars you throw at it. Right? And that's basically what this chart shows, that you can throw more money at the world if you want, but you're not necessarily creating more or better opportunities. So let's hold that thought. And, 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 and let's, let's look forward because that is exactly right. And it comes down to the question of what is the principal contributor to success and how much of it is execution and how much of it is other things. So what's the problem? So the problem is number and quality of good ideas doesn't scale or invention has its limits, right? So, so I think of this as the quality density of uh, startups that get started, ideas we see, projects that get spawned, um, you know, and, and what happens is that if you believe that there is sort of a fixed number of good ones that's a function of some law of nature. And I don't know whether it scales with population or it scales with, with GNP or it scales with some astronomical phenomenon or something like that, but it moves very slowly. And you assume that then there's this not quite constant but, but, but fairly limited number of really fantastic ideas, then the more things that get started, the lower the quality density. And, and what that prior chart really shows is that venture capitalists, venture capital investors have been suffering from, from that decline of quality density. And more cost does not equal more value, and this gets to the execution problem. So just because a, a project is more expensive doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to create more value. In fact, as I'm going to show in the semiconductor industry, the opposite is generally true. Right? Not always, but generally true. Uh, but what happens when you start throwing lots of money at a project is you shift from option economics where, you know, the amount I'm investing is very small compared to the amount I stand to gain uh, to equity economics where I'm paying a fair price for something and that value may go up or it may go down. 
right? So what happened in the venture business, and I will show you what's happened in the semiconductor business, is we've really shifted from option economics to equity economics. We're throwing tons of money at things, hoping that uh, by emphasizing execution and by taking on big projects, we'll create more value. And in fact, the opposite is true. Um, so when you think then about paying a lot of money to buy into things that are not creating a lot of value, it's a transition from buy low, sell high, to buy high, sell low. That's why the venture industry overall is losing money. So now let's look at semiconductors. So semiconductor investing is following exactly the same trend. So here what I plotted, and, and this was kind of a hard chart to, to make uh, uh, useful, um, but the orange curve, which corresponds to the left scale, is investments in, and this is worldwide investments in uh, venture-backed semiconductor companies by quarter. Okay, so the thing to realize is you read the left-hand scale at any point and you annualize by multiplying by four. These are absolutely staggering numbers. But you can see that the shape of the curve is very much like the shape of the venture capital curve overall. And then the little tiny bars that are stacking up on the bottom here uh, correspond to the right scale, and that's the annual sales of the semiconductor industry. So I normalized it back here to the point where, where they're roughly the same. And you can see that the sales of the semiconductor industry, and we think this is going back pretty far, we think that the industry has been going crazy, but compared to the amount of venture capital investment that's flowed into it, it has hardly grown, right? So if the number and quality of good ideas scales with the size of the industry, right, which might be a reasonable proxy, then the venture capital, if, if, if the amount of venture capital flowing in here was correct, and, you know, it's hard to know what correct is, but if it was, then the amount of venture capital flowing in by the end of 2007 would be, you know, what would that be four times the amount that the industry can reasonably sustain. So one would expect that semiconductor venture investing would follow the same returns curve or, or, or function as venture investing overall. So here is the beginning of the evidence about that. So what I've plotted here, I've looked at the years from 2005 to 2007. And I've said, let's look at three, uh, uh, three numbers. One, how much total venture capital has flowed in over that period? And the answer was about $6 billion. Um, so roughly $2 billion a year, roughly $500 million a quarter, and you get that off the prior slide. The second piece of data is how much of that has come out in exits, right? Uh, and here I looked at the value of M&A transactions and IPOs on the date they were announced. And I'll show you a little bit more data about this. And the thing to, re the, to understand is that it's very rare that you actually get that out on the date it was announced. But it's a measurement point, and it's often a best case measurement point, especially now it's a best case measurement point. So let's look at that. And so over that three-year period, uh, the amount that's come out is about $4 billion. Right? So you think, okay, there's $2 billion sloshing around in the system, but not so fast because the ones that come out, or at least the ones that came out in this period, in aggregate made a little bit of money. And if you go back and you look at how much venture capital was invested in the companies that exited here, the answer is about a billion and a half. So we left 2007 with $4.5 billion sloshing around the system somewhere. And the question is, what's likely to happen to it? So we do have a little bit more data today. It's a year later. What happened in 2008? I, I don't have the final numbers haven't been uh, released yet. But I think that the numbers are, because uh, uh, semiconductor uh, investing activity did slow down in 2008. There was about another billion dollars, and that's probably correct, plus or minus 100 million, invested in 2008. It was very hard for me to find uh, more than uh, 300, 350 million dollars worth of exits. And those exits probably accounted for a um, hundred million dollars, maybe a hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, so what that means is that we've got another 800, 850 million dollars, something on that order, sloshing around in the system today relative to what was sloshing around in the system before, right? Um, so the question is, where's that money going to go? Right. Well, when I showed this to some investors, they said, oh, this is a problem, 
right? But that's actually not the real problem, because if you thought that all that money sloshing around was going to make money, then you'd think, oh, it's just a matter of time, we'll be fine. The problem is that it won't, right? And this data really, uh, I was surprised when I put this together, because I, you know, I, I put this talk together knowing what the answer was going to be, but this was even worse than I suspected. So here what I've done is I've said, okay, let's look at semiconductor IPOs, uh, 2000 to the present, and remember the present was the end of 2007, although there were no semiconductor IPOs in 2008, so I didn't have to update this chart. Um, and what we're looking at is how, what, how much are those companies worth? What is their enterprise value as of, in this case, April 15th, 2008, sorted into a bunch of buckets, right? And so the biggest bucket is more than a billion, the smallest bucket is less than 100 million, um, and how, what does this distribution look like? And so what you can see is that the median is about $200 uh, million. And if you assume that venture capitalists owned about 60% of that company at the time that it went public, that would mean that venture capitalists got at the median $135 million back. So if it cost at the median less than $135 million to create these companies, then at the median you break even, above the median you make money, below you lose. Uh, if it costs more, obviously that's a, a different situation. What I can tell you is that if you were to update this today, the entire curve moves over to the left, and we have a bunch of companies that are in the less than 100 million case where their enterprise value is actually negative, right? Uh, and, you know, it turns out there were two companies that went public since 2000, semiconductor business, that in uh, April of this year were worth more than a billion dollars. Uh, the two companies were Marvell and Atheros, Atheros being a spin-out from Stanford. I also was one of the first investors in Atheros and I'm still on their board, so I was very happy about that. Atheros enterprise value has fallen below a billion dollars, so it's just left one company there. Hopefully, hopefully that will, will come back. So if venture capitalists are raising increasingly large funds with increasingly large amounts of money and are dependent upon very large exits in order to create high multiple returns on, those money, on that money, the semiconductor business has become a less than productive place to put that money, but yet the amount of money flowing in is continuing to increase. What's up? Well, maybe these companies are getting bought, or maybe not. So here we're looking at M&A activity, right? And this again is back to last April. And this has become, these values were baked in last April. Um, so we've got less than 100, 100 to 250, and 250 to 300, number of companies. The median in this case was 80 million. And if you assume that when a company got acquired, the venture capitalists own 80%, it wasn't diluted by public uh, uh, shareholders then the median VC return was about $65 million. So if they cost on average $65 million to start, you break even or at the median, less uh, you make money, more you lose money. Um, but this is, this is pretty stark. I can tell you that that median for 2008 was probably, and I still only have anecdotal data, but the median was probably $20, $30 million. Uh, and in 2009, the median might be uh, one or two million dollars, right? So it could be that as many companies are given away as are sold for anything in 2009. So the money sloshing around in the system is not going to come out productively in M&A, is not going to come out productively in IPOs unless something changes. So um, what's going on? Why is the investment going in? Why is it not going to be productive? What do we do about it? So I think the reason that the money has been flowing in is because the fa fabulous IC investing has looked easy. Building a fabulous semiconductor company has looked really easy, right? You don't have to invest in any infrastructure, right? Anyone can play, right? You buy some CAD tools, contract with TSMC or a foundry, and you're in the fabulous IC business. Um, improving tools and canned intellectual property has made developing chips look really simple, right? When I started out as an engineer, there wasn't a lot of canned intellectual property. I had to work with individual transistors. And, you know, now you can buy uh, almost anything as a canned block and interconnect it, right? So you can envision very productively making very large chips on a relatively small amount of money. You can buy the IP for whatever you have to pay for it. You can buy some tools. Assembling the blocks doesn't take a lot of, of, uh, of um, work, so it looks cheap. Boy, for $10 million, for $20 million, I can tape out a chip that is pretty complex. Right? 
Um, and the fact that the uh, industry has been horizontally disaggregating um, means that there are more sockets to fill. So, you know, when I started my career, most companies that made systems developed their own chips. There weren't a lot of chips for them to buy. Uh, so therefore, if you were a chip company, it was a limited amount you could sell. Um, but over time, obviously, you know, computer companies have stopped making computers. They buy things from the I buy whole boards now, let alone the chips themselves. Consumer electronics industry has horizontally disaggregated. The cell phone industry is horizontally disaggregated. So there's lots of places to sell things. So cheap to make, lots of IP out there, don't have to invest in any infrastructure, lots of people to sell to. What could possibly go wrong? Well, if you look back in history, who knows? There are a lot of success cases. I could be Broadcom, I could be Marvell, I could be a Theros. Why not? I'll take a gamble. Uh, but the reality is different. So first of all, the cost of, uh, of assembling a bunch of IP blocks into a chip is pretty simple, but the cost of realizing a product is not. It's very, very high, and it's going up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why and how far and by how much it's going up. Um, this is the point that was the big aha for me, right? Innovation at modern integration scale is really, really hard to sustain, right? If you're building a really complicated chip with a bunch of IP blocks that you've bought, where's the innovation, right? Now, sometimes you can say, well, the innovation's in software. Okay, that's fine. Sometimes you can say that I've had an architectural innovation and, and, and um, you know, the, 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 it's the interconnection of the blocks in which my intellectual property is, is embedded. That may be true. Sometimes it's one little block surrounded by a bunch of big stuff. Um, so the question is, what is the real value of that innovation relative to its cost to realize? And that's what I'm going to look at uh, in a second. And we're not going to back up my Mac. Okay. Um, so if innovation at these scales is hard to sustain, then where is the value? And I will argue, and you'll see why, that the value is shifting back to increasing per transistor work, not exploiting sheer numbers of transistors. So if all of that is true, we have to revisit our assumptions about what should we invest in, what should we not invest in, where is the value being created, where is the value not being created, and what is likely to happen in the future, and, and in particular, what are its implications for the industry? Okay, so let's go back and say, how did fabulousness happen in the first place? And, you know, it's hard to remember that 20, 25 years ago, this was very controversial. So the first thing is that CMOS scaling became very predictable. There was no need to manage the process itself in order to exploit it. So I remember when, you know, nobody quite understood how the transistors work. You'd lose the recipe every once in a while. If you didn't run the fab, you couldn't design anything. There were no models. There were no simulations. You had to be in the fab. You had to run stuff. You had to develop a process for every product because you had to optimize for individual transistors and stuff like that. By the early, mid-80s, that was no longer true. And CMOS became completely predictable. The number of predictions about how far CMOS would scale, the rate at which it would scale, the performance, et cetera, that, that you can look back 20, 25 years, 30 years, the number of them that are accurate is just uncanny, right? So it became very predictable. So you could decouple the design activity, I'll assume what the transistor is going to be like in the future, from the development of the process itself. Um, when that happened, there was decreasing marginal value in just staying on the predicted curve, and there was more value in thinking about how am I going to use those transistors whose existence I can predict in the future. Um, and the evolution of CMOS was so fast, right, that the transistors were improving at a rate greater and improving in performance and density and cost, et cetera, at a rate faster than we could figure out what to do with them, right? So the marginal transistors on a die became free. I can add a few more transistors. It costs me nothing, right? Um, I don't have to be at the leading edge of process because the mainstream is adequate to 90%, 95%, 98% of what I can envision building. And when it's not, I can throw some more transistors at it because it's, they're practically free. And so the scarcest asset was no longer the fab. It was the best idea of what to do with this process that was wrong. So that's where we got fabulous semiconductor companies. And basically, the credo was, let's make extraordinary use of ordinary process, as opposed to let's try to make the process itself extraordinary. Right? So that was the idea. So what's happened? Well, one interesting thing that's happened is that as the fabless industry evolved, 
the penalty for fablessness decreased to the point where we forgot about what was it all about in the first place. So back in the early 80s, if you wanted to build a fabulous semiconductor company, the first thing you had to figure out is where am I going to get capacity, right? Who will sell me wafers, right? And that was not an easy question to answer. And then you find out who will sell you wafers, and you have to ask what kind of process will they sell me, right? And the answer typically was something which was pretty far removed from the state of the art, whatever the state of the art was. Because the people that had invested in state-of-the-art facilities were building their own products based on this, and they weren't going to sell the, the uh, capacity because, A, they were making productive use of it themselves, uh, and, B, they, uh, we, we, the, the, the modeling of the process, uh, statistical process controls, all those things hadn't evolved to the point where early in the life of a process you could actually release it to a customer, right? So you had to wait a while before, A, somebody would want to sell it, B, you could get it. Um, so as a result of that, those of us who were doing fabulous stuff back in the early 80s had to make an assumption. And the assumption we had to make was that whatever we developed was going to be at least two process nodes behind what a vertically integrated competitor was going to develop. And so if we didn't have an advantage, two process nodes back or more, we were crazy to even get started, right? So the basic assumption was I'm going to be behind. I'm only going to do those things where it's okay to be behind. But interestingly, as more and more of the industry became fabulous, the foundries who were making capacity available got better and better and better and better relative to the integrated IDMs. And so the time uh, between the introduction of a new node and its availability to fabulous uh, uh, customers contracted. And that's what this chart illustrates to the point where it was possible for a startup company to be on the same node if it chose to be as Intel, right? So I'm a startup company. I can use the same node as Intel because TSMC will sell it to me at the same time that Intel releases it to production. That sounds really attractive. You would think that that would allow us to create some hugely valuable companies, but it's an absolute trap, right? So as a result of that trap, we have this siren song of process creating this siren song of integration. Come build more. Build it on a more advanced process. How could that be bad? Right. So OK, we're at parity. So this, what I call compensatory creativity that we had to exhibit 20 years ago, we had to make up for being two process nodes or more behind, we no longer had to worry about it. Hey, I can make the same thing Intel makes. That sounds good until you say it out loud. Right. Um, second, I can make not only the same thing Intel makes, but I can make it at the same complexity scale as Intel because I have the same process available to me. I can buy all of this IP. I can fill a reticle. They can fill a reticle. So I can build something of incredible scale now. Right? I don't have to be simple. Right? Integration is good. Right? Um, and scale looks easy and cheap. I can buy a bunch of IP blocks. I'll replicate a bunch of MIPS cores on a chip. I'll replicate a bunch of, you know, just fill it with SRAM, you know, whatever I want. Um, I don't have to make custom blocks. Why not keep my custom blocks small? I'll just build something of great complexity because customers are going to pay me more for that, right? And that makes it easier for me to compete with Intel. So that sounds really good. It sounded really good to the tune of probably $10 billion that got invested in projects to do that. But it's really, really dangerous, right? Large transistor counts make value creation harder, not easier, because you have to spread the innovation across a larger base. So the denominator has gotten really big. What about the numerator, right? So if you think about it, you just think about it in what's my average innovation per transistor? Well, at the scale where you have to buy large IP blocks and do all those kinds of things, it's very hard to maintain large amounts of innovation per transistor. But your cost per transistor is the same as the people you're competing against, right? So you get the innovation diluted by a lot of work just to get the innovation out to the market, right? Um, the second problem is that increasing scale radically influences uh, product realization cost, and it's not linear. It's exponential. And I'll show you in a second where the trap comes from. But these really complicated chips look simple to start, but they're very, very expensive to complete. 
And that's where most of the money goes, right? So the initial tape out generally costs 10%, 15%, 20% of the total cost to realize the product, but you forget that at the time at which you're visualizing the product, right? So what do we have to do? So system scale, as I'll show you, now approximates infrastructure cost at the transition to fabulous. Um, but raw density is increasing, but the real transistor utility is not tracking Moore's law, right? Because uh, Moore's law is beginning to stall. Um, which means that now the premium is shifting, as I alluded before, from how many transistors can I use, because that's very expensive, to how much work can I do per transistor, right? And how much innovation do I get per transistor? And so one of the things I'll point out is I've invested in as many semiconductor startups as probably anybody. Uh, but I have yet to invest in one that proposes to do an SOC at 90 nanometers, right, right out of the chute, uh, let alone 65 nanometers, let alone 45 nanometers. Some of the larger companies in which I'm invest an investor or have been an investor, they evolved to the point where they can do this. But if I see a business plan and somebody says, I'm going to start at today 65 nanometers, 45 nanometers, I won't even listen to the pitch. It's like, you know what, if you have to be at process parity, I'm not going to invest. Okay, so here's some more startling data, right? Yes. So the question is whether you really can reduce the development cost, right? So the question I would ask, and I ask this of all the entrepreneurs that I meet who are proposing to use a state-of-the-art process, why do you need to do that, right? But here's, here's the issue. So, so um, first of all, the uh, yielded price per transistor at a uh, state-of-the-art node, at node N, is usually higher than node N minus 1, right? Second problem is, so I'm talking about yielded price per transistor because the yields tend to be, uh, the yields tend to be lower and the prices tend to be higher. So the price per wafer of node n is generally much higher than node n minus 1, node n minus 2, right? Partly because foundries can charge a premium for the state-of-the-art process because the people that really need it will pay that premium. Second problem is that uh, there are fewer sources, right? So the uh, argument that I want to be at a state-of-the-art process out of the chute because my manufacturing cost will be lower almost never holds water, right? It's So the things you have to look at are you have to look at how much am I paying per unit area of the wafer and how much yield do I get per unit area of the wafer. So it turns out that when the processes mature, they approach an asymptote that would cause what you're saying to be true. I have more transistors per unit area. If the, if, if the cost per unit area is the same, then my transistors cost me less. Early in the life of a process, however, the actual cost is influenced by what can you buy a unit area for at that, uh, at that node. And generally, it's a multiple of two nodes prior, right? And in fact, 2x is a general, generally good ratio to use for two nodes prior. And the, the second question then is, what are my yields in that node? And very early in the life of that node, my yields are low relative to more mature processes. And so it turns out that early in the life of a process, the costs are actually higher than building a node or two behind. And then the gap will slowly close over time. Um, but what, you know, what tends to happen is that, especially in cases where a node transition requires refacilitation of a factory, you end up with lots of capacity at node n minus 2, n minus 3 that can't be, uh, uh, that, that can't be easily uh, repurposed right, to more advanced processes. And so the price at which the people that own those factories will sell you wafers gets to be very, very, very low. So this gap between the cost per area of node n and node n minus 2 stays large for an interestingly long period of time. Right? So that's the issue. So you're right, theoretically, the cost should be a lot lower if I use uh, the most advanced process. But in reality, the costs almost always tend to be higher, and they almost always tend to stay higher for longer than you think. And longer than you think can be 
um, five years. Right? So, so that's so 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 uh, uh, that's the fundamental problem. So it turns out that that you know what you get when you move to node n plus one is much higher density. You used to get higher performance, but I'm going to talk about that. You used to get lower power, but I'm going to talk about that. But mostly what you get is higher density. And so the question is, can you make productive use of that higher density by itself? And my argument is, generally, no. So here's, here's an interesting uh, set of numbers. So what I plotted here is I plotted how much does it cost to build a state-of-the-art fab, right? And how much has it cost per year? And the two curves are uh, current dollars. Uh, so dollars in that particular year, which are the orange dots, and uh, 2007 dollars on a constant basis. So this, so the yellow uh, 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 data points are inflation adjusted. And so you can kind of read across, and, and you can see that the cost of a fab has been increasing. And in 2007 dollars, a state-of-the-art fab is a few billion dollars. And if you go back to, like, 1980, 1985, uh, you know, a state-of-the-art fab in 1985 was maybe you know, uh, 100 million, uh, 1985 dollars, uh, which is 200 million, 2007 dollars, something like that, right? So you can see the rate at which this is increasing. This slide surprises no one. This shows the 2007 constant dollar numbers from the prior slide plotted against uh, the cost to build, typical cost to build a fabulous semiconductor company. Right? And this is the cost from inception to break even. And if you look at this chart, there's a few interesting things that, that uh, I would point to. Uh, one, it used to be that the cost to do a fabulous company was pretty low, like in 2007 dollars in the range of $10 million to get from inception to break even. Right? Um, but something happened uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where there was a break point in the curve and the cost became extremely high, right? That's what I call the SOC era, right? That's the result of this phenomenon of why don't I fill a reticle? Why don't I integrate this SOC using all this IP? And you can see these data points are up to $100 million and counting. And I can count companies that have now absorbed uh, $200 million and will never become profitable, right? Uh, there are good examples of companies that uh, uh, used 120, 130, 150 million dollars, were not profitable, got acquired, et cetera. So when you think about this money sloshing around, the eight and a half billion dollars, whatever it is, sloshing around in the system, um, most of it is going into these companies that are building these very big SOCs where, oh, well, you know, we've already got 150 million in, why don't we put 50 million more in? Right? And we get up to 200 million. We already have 200 million dollars in, but it's a multi-billion dollar market. Let's put in another 50 million. And the cost is, has, has just become crazy. So the two things that are interesting are, number one, look at both the breakpoint and the slope. Right? So if we plot more points on this curve, it, it's very clear to see that the cost of building a fabulous company is actually increasing faster than the cost to build a fab, right? which I never would have imagined was ever true. And you can see that for a long time it was much slower because it was more or less a constant. The second thing that's really interesting is that if you look at the average cost to do an SOC company now, which is approaching $200 million, um, that's the same number of $2,007 in 1985 when we all decided building fabs was really stupid. Right? Remember, this is inflation adjusted. So right now, SOC companies cost exactly the same to build as fabs cost when we thought they were too expensive. So, you know, something has to give, right? And what's giving is that those investments are becoming uh, uh, completely unproductive. So why does it cost so much? So this was another big aha. So if you think about design and you think about how much does it cost me per transistor to operate on something, so you can look at a few different things. You can say, well, how much does it cost me to capture the design and lay it out? And on a per transistor basis, um, as you go up in uh, transistor count, the cost per transistor to design and layout actually drops, right? Because you're using very large blocks. There are relatively few of them. Uh, you put them together. The, you know, nothing is trivial. But on a per transistor basis, you get efficiencies uh, of scale. And so on a per, this is the seductivity. Boy, I can put this large chip together for relatively little. Um, 
then you, you have to tape it out and buy masks. And there's this common perception in the industry that the masks are really expensive. I, I'll, I'll show you some data that I think masks are among the cheapest things you can, you can do when you're designing chips. But, um, but there's this sense that, well, you know, as the chips get bigger, the masks get more expensive. It's interesting. I pulled some real data to draw this curve. And the real data said, actually, you know, and I, I put some error bars in the data. And it said, well, you know, uh, it, it looks like the curve slightly decreases, that there is actually some slight efficiency. The mass costs actually do drop. But, I, but there are some data points where it shows that they went up. And I said, you know, if I show that the mass cost per complexity is actually, or per transistor as you get more complex or dropping, nobody would believe me. So I said, well, you know, the range of data does have, you know, slight increase versus slight decrease. So I plotted it going up a little bit. But it's more or less constant. But then you have what I call market completion. And market completion includes verification, customer support, software, testing, its reference designs, et cetera. And it turns out that as you make the system complex, the cost to verify per transistor, the cost to write code per transistor, all of the cost to validate that code in customers' designs, the co cost sometimes to teach people how to use the product, all of that goes up exponentially. So the trap here, when you think about where does the $200 million go uh, in these companies that are absorbing this in the SOC business, where it goes is it goes in verification, it goes in trying to support customers, and it goes in so into software, right? It doesn't go into the first tape out. The problem here is if you think this through and you say, oh, well, what I'm going to do to solve this problem is I'm going to chop my design into little blocks, right? Well, okay, I'm going to buy IP, and I'm going to make IP blocks that have uh, complexity that corresponds to this point of, in the curve, and I'm going to chop my design into those blocks, and by chopping my design into those blocks, I'm going to be able to verify each of them really cheaply. I'm going to get efficiencies when I, when I combine them. All, all good things are going to happen except for one problem. The problem is you take a bunch of them and combine them, and for that brown curve, you're all the way out on the end, right? And so making IP blocks is cheap and easy. You can sell them for a relatively small amount. You can buy them for a relatively small amount. You can assemble them for a relatively small amount. And you're buying a ticket for an enormous product completion problem, right? And so that's where this, this um, seductivity lies. And that's where all of the money is going, right? And you know the thing I point out here uh, is because there's been so much focus on, oh, 65 nanometer masks are too expensive. That's why venture capitalists aren't going to invest in chip companies. And 45 nanometer masks are even more expensive. Nobody will be able to afford a tape out. And my argument is that's ridiculous, right? Because the cost of that tape out, even though it costs a million and a half bucks to tape out at 65 nanometers on average, and probably two and a half million today to tape out at 45 nanometers, is nothing. Because if to support customers, you have to burn two or three million dollars a month to have uh, customer support people where the customers live, to be writing code for those customers, things like that, then every month that is delayed in validating writing software, working with customers, customers themselves delay their programs, that's especially happening now, costs per month more than the mass cost. So the problem isn't that there's something wrong with the fabulous chip industry because masks are too expensive. The problem is that this cost of complexity is just never going to get paid back, right? All right. So uh, discipline is the new imperative. Obviously, raw transistor availability leads to very creative architectural thinking. Uh, but these basic architectural innovations lead to enormous implementation projects that just cost a fortune and are not getting paid back. So it creates the wrong ratio of inspiration to perspiration. Right? This option economics, right? We want to get huge return on what we put in. So it's too much work per unit of invention. So what we have to figure out is how do we reduce the amount of work per unit of invention? Um, and again, we get to this equity, not option economics. So my view is that as with owning fabs in the 1980s, the number of companies that can afford to build SOCs today is going to decrease. Right? And that has some interesting implications. But it has to fall. Right? It doesn't mean that the number of chip companies will fall, but it means that the number of companies that can build these large SOCs and can do integration at scale will fall. Right? Uh, and I think it's probably already falling by now. Um, but there are plenty of startup opportunities. So uh, logical extension, if bulk transistor utilization is no longer valuable, Right? We can't afford the work, and the, it, it, the innovation is masked by all the, the integration effort. Um, then marginal transistor improvement can be very valuable. And I'll show you a few places where that's true. 
certainly relative to the cost to do it. Um, or lack of easy scaling makes clever scaling uh, really important and figuring out how to do that. So let's put that in perspective, right? So this is a chart that Intel put together in 1999 about power density on uh, integrated circuits. This has been shown quite a bit. Um, so basically, it's watts per centimeter squared. And we're just looking at time based on process and operating frequency and chip size. And you know, it was a big alarm bell in 1999 because we were at the hot plate point, And the extrapolation was, we'll be up to the temperature of the surface of the sun. Obviously, that won't actually happen. But the issue was, how are we going to deal with this? Because we're just making stuff smaller and smaller and smaller. Power density is going up. Obviously, we're not going to build and package chips that um, are uh, of the temperature of the sun's surface. But on the other hand, if we don't, how are we going to get the advantage of scaling? Why is the next process node going to be more uh, valuable if we can't use it? Because the power density, if we use it to its full extent, will be too high to be of any practical use. Um, <laughs> what's interesting is, if you look at that, uh, there is real data about how this has affected the actual ability to exploit new processes. So what I plotted here uh, from some data I got from IBM is uh, what is the relative performance per power density? We make the power density higher. Does the performance go up uh, linearly, superlinearly, less, whatever? Uh, and the answer is that at 45 nanometers, it has started to decline. So as gate length decreases, so that time is moving from the right to the left in this chart, um, we were improving in our ability to make use of this increasing power density up till about 45 nanometers, and then it just started to decline, right? So the trend was reversed, and 45 nanometers were worse than 65 nanometers, 32 nanometers worse than 45, 22 is worse than 32, et cetera, et cetera. So we're scaling the transistors. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're costing us more to make, because these processes are getting very exotic. But we're not able to derive a performance benefit if for no other reason than we're limited by power. So um, the question then is, where is the value? Is the value in then just using billions of these transistors, or is the value in improving these transistors? Similar problem, flash memory. Um, so flash memory works by, uh, by uh, 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 basically trapping charge. Uh, to trap a charge, you need electrons. Uh, as you make transistors smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the number of electrons you have is fewer and fewer and fewer. This is any, anything having to do with electrons is a statistical process. So as the number of electrons declines, the ability to predict what's going to happen, it diminishes. And what you end up with is a question, can I actually store data anymore? So what's plotted here uh, is uh, process node uh, of feature size uh, versus the number of electrons per bit, right? So you would expect that as the uh, node gets smaller, transistors get smaller, number of bits diminishes. Uh, and then I've looked at one bit per cell and two bits per cell. This is Samsung data. And as you would expect, the number of electrons per, um, per bit is decreasing. But the spec for flash memory is 10-year retention, right? We all expect that flash memory is going to store stuff for 10 years. But you can see that at 20 nanometers, a uh, one-bit uh, cell uh, basically just intersects that. Uh, a two-bit cell has one-year retention, right? Most, I should tell you that most of the chips you buy now for your digital camera are uh, probably 30 to 40 nanometer uh, processes and two to four bits per cell. So my suggestion is don't count on storing those pictures for more than a year, right? So the question is, what do we do about that? Flash memory is going to die uh, below 20 nanometers because it doesn't remember anymore, all right? There just aren't enough electrons. So somebody's got to figure out a solution to that problem. So the stuff I'm investing in now is all that, right? And what's really interesting, so I've invested in a company that is addressing the question of power and power density in CMOS. I've invested in a company that's done um, integrated CMOS photonics, where they're building, because copper interconnect is, I was going to bring some data on that. Um, copper is becoming power inefficient at speeds above 10 gigahertz. So you know we've got to start using photons instead of electrons. But how do you integrate that on a chip? So several years ago, I invested in a company that spun out of Caltech, figured out how to integrate sub-wavelength photonic devices on otherwise standard CMOS. Um, that's really exotic stuff. They have products in the market. It works great. 
Uh, I've invested in a company that will have product in the market probably next year with an alternative technology to Flash uh, that scales much better and, and, uh, and gets around this, this uh, uh, memory versus density problem. And the reason I point this out is to say, A, so that's where I think the productive investments are, but B, to then be able to tell you that at the time these companies become profitable, each one of them will have spent maybe $100 million. One of them may be substantively less than that. Certainly not 150, certainly not $200 million. So if you think about this, the value attached to these kinds of inventions is huge now relative to almost anything else you can do in the semiconductor business because it's the platform on which everything else will be based. The cost, uh, surprisingly, is way less than the cost to build an SOC because the investment doesn't have to include all of that uh, 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 complexity-related verification stuff. You can focus it all on the development of the technology and not incidentally, because the technology is very valuable, you can find partners who will augment the amount you're spending by spending other amounts themselves, right? And so the equation here has really changed, where not only the value of these kinds of process-related innovations has gone way up, but the relative cost to do them has gone way down. Uh, in the early days of Fabulous, 20, 25 years ago, if someone had said to me that was going to be the case by now, I would have thought it was nuts, right? But it turns out, actually, the, uh, uh, to be true. So what are the effects of this? So the most valuable startups are going to be the relatively few. There aren't a lot of them. You can't in invent them by throwing lots of money at them. They come every once in a while. Um, but the relatively few that change the effective process curves. So instead of now having completely predictable process, no marginal value in deviating from the predicted process curve, because you can't deviate enough to create enough value, um, now most of the value is attached to how you keep the curves moving, right? How you, be, you, you, you increase the utility per transistor as uh, the technology continues to scale. So I think it's in process augmentation. I think there are some circuit things that can be done that are very horizontal and very broadly applicable. Again, cases where uh, investment is made in a, in a, in a, a fairly contained area uh, that is then uh, uh, very broadly applicable. Um, the most widespread opportunities are those that rebalance inspiration versus perspiration, uh, where the value of the idea is not diluted by a lot of non-value creating stuff that's just required to get it into the marketplace. Um, and the largest SOCs will increasingly be the province of very big companies that can afford to do them and can spread the investment in them across lots of markets. Because that's another implication of all of this data is we're not going to see SOCs per market anymore because they're just too expensive to develop. We'll see them as platforms that can address multiple things. But you have to have enough scale in order to be able to capitalize on uh, those kinds of things. Um, and the smartest of these scale class companies will figure out a way to capitalize on the innovations that other companies are uh, engaged in. And what's particularly interesting, if you follow this thread and you think this through, that the relationship between small companies and big companies is going to change. So if I think about my history around fabulous semiconductor companies, um, the small companies, startup companies, have done mostly the same thing that big companies have done. They've just done it in a different way. Um, so we've looked for opportunities to, you know, be two nodes behind or more. We've looked for opportunities to be efficient. But, you know, when you look at the structure of these companies, the kinds of products they make have tended to be the same, with, you know, a few exceptions. Nobody's entered the PC microprocessor market in a long time or things like that. But those are the, those are the exceptions. There, there's, there's been not a lot of difference. But if you follow this through, what this implies is that there has to be a difference between what the big companies are doing and what the little companies are doing. And what that means is that both the little companies and the big companies have to think through what is their strategy to capitalize on what the others are doing. So for the big companies whose boards I'm on, the point is, well, we can't innovate everything. We have an advantage because of our ability to do stuff at scale. So what we have to figure out how to do is we have to figure out how to make our SOCs platforms that can accommodate the intellectual property being created by all these Startups where our advantage is not that we invented all these little things, but that no one can use them without us because they can't be integrated into a system without us because only large companies like us can afford that integration. And conversely, what small companies have to figure out how to do is how to pick platforms 
uh, that will enable them to move their technology into the market, even though they can't complete the products for their customers, right? So this is a different kind of dynamic that will create, I think, a very different set of relationships. So what does that lead to? So in the early days, prefabulous, which was the dawn of time to about 1985, um, semiconductor companies had a process per product line, right? Had to be vertically integrated. Everything had to be developed together. The fabulous era, we ended up with predictable process and design value added. So we had people that made chips, we had people that designed chips, or groups that made chips, groups that designed chips, and they didn't have to have, they, we were able to abstract their communication to models that worked. In the post fabulous era, we add some, uh, some um, tiers to this. Um, so we're still going to have baseline process. Right? And the baseline process will be consolidated in a decreasing number of places. So that because the cost to build a fab is you know, 3 billion going to 5 billion going to 10 billion, there will be a decreasing number of those that get built around the world. Uh, and that's where the baseline processes will be housed. But those baseline processes, as I've described, are insufficient to deliver all the value that they need to value. And so there will be a tier of innovation, which I call process augmentation, which, where there'll be companies that don't themselves run factories. They may run pieces of the process, uh, but develop technology that gets run on these baseline processes. And you know, as I've said, I think that's where I've been you know, investing mostly in semiconductor-related startups, at least. And I think there'll be an interesting class of those Companies. Uh, interesting class means that, uh, again, my, my experience is every five years there are a couple of semiconductor companies you wish you were a part of. I have a feeling every five years there'll be a couple of these that'll be very interesting. Um, circuits based platforms. How do we take this base process and how do we build things that are horizontal and broadly applicable? Um, so these are inventions that, don't, that are not necessarily market specific, that then don't have this kind of market related complexity related cost attached to them. Um, and the rest of the startups that are interesting will probably end up living there. There's a lot of really interesting work going on now in how to exploit um, deep submicron uh, processes in uh, analog areas and data conversion and stuff like that where uh, in memories and a few other things where there's uh, uh, innovation that is able to apply across a very broad spectrum of markets without having to tackle all of the the issues attached with completing products in those markets. And then we'll have these you know, products that, uh, or companies that do scale matched product design. Big companies will do big products, little companies will do little products, that kind of thing, but it's what people can afford. And there'll be this diversity of, uh, of, of activity based on level of scale of company where, again, the small companies and the big companies will look very different. So I think the challenge then as we move into this era is really to figure out what do I want to invest in? What do I not want to invest in? Where is value going to be created? Where is value not going to be created? What can we do at scale? And to focus on the things that are, uh, that are really going to matter as opposed to focusing on the things that look like what it was that mattered uh, you know, n years ago. So what I'm hoping is that, you know, again, if we think about this hard enough, that uh, two things will happen. Number one, that this kind of thinking will scare a lot of money out of the, out of the venture capital business. And most of the money that's been invested in venture capital, uh, semiconductor, uh, directed venture capital will go away because it just can't be productive enough, right? Uh, so I hope that uh, as we look out in time, the aggregate amount of money that my peers and I are investing will decline. I think it needs to decline by a factor of at least five, maybe more. Uh, but the second thing is that I'm hoping that the number of companies um, that are really thinking critically about where values created will increase, so there'll be a good flow of productive things in which to invest. So with that, uh, that's my, uh, my take on the future. Thank you. So, yeah. Because uh, a million years ago, was uh, <laughs> we weren't around then. Well, you know, uh, my, my, uh, we weren't around then. And, you know, semiconductors, of course, were made accidentally back then. Um, but my real question, actually, is you, you don't mention uh, field programmable devices or yes. FPGAs. Yes. Where do they fit into this picture? So, um, so FPGAs are a species 
of a generally programmable platform device. Right? So uh, I would argue that FPGAs are in that circuit-based platform area. Now, FPGAs, there's, there's an interesting issue with FPGAs. So, so I was a founder of a company called Actel in 1985. Uh, one of the first fabulous semiconductor companies that actually did some process augmentation. And back then, our first product was 1,000 gates, right? And when you're designing with them, we thought 1,000 gates was a lot, and the dream was to get the 10,000 gates of programmable logic. And when you're designing with 1,000 gates or 10,000 gates, all the gates are the same, right? All you need is logic. You can build flip-flops and gates and stuff like that. Uh, so we could build something which was very highly general. It could go anywhere. And they all, all FPGAs for a long time looked the same. Right? So the product line was number of gates, number of IOs, everything else was identical. Um, so in that case, that was a good circuits-based platform. Right? So those were a case where, and, 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 and Actel was actually one of the points on the chart about how much it cost to create a fabulous semiconductor company. I think Actel spent maybe five million bucks in current dollars, which might be 10 or 12 million dollars today, uh, to get all the way through to profitability because it only had to develop one product and er its entire market could use it until right? we decided to go from 1,000 to 2,000 or however many gates. Um, so that kind of thing can still be done if you can conceive of something which on a reasonable amount of money uh, can address a very large market by virtue of, in that case, its programmability. The hard part with programmable logic now, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating because the world needs new programmable logic technologies and they're not evolving, is that um, you can do that again at the 10,000, 100,000 gate level but it's not really interesting. And what the market wants new programmable uh, technologies for are very highly complex systems. But those systems are very difficult to build out of blocks that are not system dependent. And so the conundrum for programmable logic is, how do you make something which can address the complexity that is, uh, uh, that, that is demanding some new technology, but that then ends up not being market specific? Right? If somebody can figure that out, I'll invest in it. But out of probably 10 or 15, maybe, programmable logic proposals that I've seen over the last probably three or four years, nobody's been able to crack that one. They're all either not complex enough to solve a real problem, given that the older technology does fine at low levels of complexity, or too market-specific to be able to reasonably pay back the investment it takes to build something at that complexity. So. I Uh, remains, even even when you're using FPGA. Well, so certainly it does for the FPGA user, but that doesn't stop people from using FPGAs because some people will pay. So system companies can pay back some of that complexity. The hard part is for chip companies to pay that back, right? Um, but the the issue that I described, where these these uh, FPGAs are uh, at, at at complexity have to become more market specific. That's part of the problem, right? Is that then the cost to assure yourself that they really can serve a particular market, because if they can't, then you've got nothing to do, is too high and, and, and prohibitively so. Yes? How does the EDA industry fit in this picture? How do you um, so the problem with the EDA industry is that its scale is so small, it doesn't show up on any of the charts, right? <laughs> um, I honestly don't know what's going to happen to the EDA industry. Um, the EDA industry has is, is, is been shrinking in real you know, terms for probably 10 or 15 years. Uh, and it has been doing that monotonically. Um, you know, there would be no complexity problem were it not for EDA. EDA made all of this possible. EDA companies have never figured out a way to get paid for it, right? So EDA, the EDA industry is subsisting at a level that is just ever so slightly above the threshold where everybody would give up and go home, right? And the semiconductor industry has been very good at keeping it at about that persistence threshold. Uh, maybe it'll do that forever, you know, it, or maybe something will give. I honestly don't know, right? But I will tell you that I haven't, even though I've been a founder of a bunch of EDA companies going back 25 years, uh, I have not invested in an EDA company. I don't even look at EDA business plans. And the reason is because none of them has been able to figure out how to get to scale. Right? So it's a big problem. As I said, e either it'll just remain at subsistence forever or, or something will give. But I, I, don't, I don't know how that's going to happen. So, yes? A follow up on the FPGAs. Uh, tile architecture is a really popular you know, academic environment today. And I think Tile Era has a product. Mm -hmm. And if you consider screen processors kind of 
same kind of idea. Where do you see that type of thing going, where it's higher level than an FPGA, there's still tremendous development costs for the things, but conceivably integration and support could be easier? Right. So, so the problem with all of those, and some of them are very interesting architectures, but the problem is that they transfer too much, uh, 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 too much um, uh, development difficulty onto the customer, right? So the, so the value of FPGAs is, because FPGAs, I mean, the thing about programmability is programmability always yields a result, which is a compromise, right, uh, in, in, in every performance dimension. But you're willing to, uh, to accept that compromise because you get uh, development efficiency. Right? So I'll build a lousy implementation really efficiently, and sometimes that's, that's good enough. Um, the problem with all of these tile-based architectures so far has been that their programming models are A, complex, and B, unknown and new. And so every one of them has the problem of, uh, uh, of, of how to uh, get customers to the point where the actual development effort is lower with the programmable solution than it would be building hardware, and most customers will conclude, well, you know, it may or may not be uh, uh, more efficient for me to build hardware or use some other approach, but at least I know what challenge I'm undertaking. So every one of these tile architectures, and there have been a bunch of them, that are, some of which are quite interesting, has run into the problem of customers not being willing to take the initial risk, and until customers are willing to take the initial risk, there's no infrastructure and ecosystem around programming to reduce the programming costs. So it's a conundrum that none of them is broken through. What everyone has then tried to do, and so far, every one of them has failed, is to say, okay, it's too complicated for my customer to program this, but I know how to program it. I'll program it myself, which puts all of those companies on that brown curve, which was the thing that programmability was supposed to have eliminated. So that's the conundrum. Now, if you can break through the programming problem and really map from plain vanilla C or some hardware description language or something like that down to one of these tile architectures, predictably with no intervention, that kind of thing, that would be fantastic. But you know that clearly is a hard problem. The heroic compilers just never happen. The heroic compilers that never happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. So you know, someday again, it's like maybe it's like the EDA industry. Something has to give. There are a lot of smart people working on the problem. Maybe someday there'll be a solution to that problem. But it's been really hard to bet on it because it's a tough, tough problem. Yes. Can you give an example of scale matched product design? Um. Sure. So what I mean by that is, so let's see if this answers your question, that large companies, so Broadcom, can contemplate a single chip cell phone, right? Broadcom can say, uh, we have all the technology, we're going to invest a half a billion dollars to develop a single chip cell phone chip. It's going to be extremely complex internally. Uh, it's going to require a huge amount of, 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 of um, hand-holding with our customer, software development, et cetera, because of the complex, uh, complexity of that device. But the number of companies on the planet that can do it is very small. We can do it. Maybe Qualcomm can do it. Maybe Intel could do it if they chose to do it. Maybe, you know, maybe ST could do it. Um, but it's worth it for us to do it because if we succeed, there's a large market for it, and there won't be very much competition because not very many people could do it. But you know, picking an example, so a Theros, a company whose board I'm on, could not do that at this point, right? Because it can't afford a half a billion dollars of investment or whatever it would take to get into another market. But on the other hand, they can say, well, you know, and I don't want to speak very specifically. I should have picked an example I know nothing about. But, um, but they can say, well, you know, if you look at the products that don't yet use the single chip uh, device, uh, those products are divided into multiple devices. And we could pick off one of those. We could pick off something that does just connectivity or just the media function or something like that. And we could do that, right? And that might cost us $50 million to develop. We can afford that. That's a reasonable investment for us to make. We'll do that. A startup company might look at that same design and say, we certainly can't do the single chip uh, design because we can't afford uh, 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 half a billion dollars. We can't do this other thing that uh, you know is a multifunction kind of thing because 50 million in development. By the time we're done building a distribution channel, building customer support, that kind of thing, we'll be spending 150 million dollars to try to support that. But we can do a transceiver, right? And so we can just look at some part of the RF chain and we can say, all right, this device, we can do that. So so scale match product design means instead of everybody at every scale saying we're going to target the same socket, 
thinking, okay, what can I reasonably afford to do, and where are the applications that, that, will, that will assign value to that piece that I can afford to do? Do you think a company has to do all those four things to be successful, or one of those, two out of four? I, I think what you'll find is that companies succeed on the basis of one, right? There will be, you know, continue to be IDMs. There will continue to be companies like Intel that will develop baseline process, will develop some of their own augmentation. Uh, will develop some of their horizontal platforms. We'll have a broad spectrum of things that they build. Um, but generally, I think companies will succeed at one place or another because it's hard to afford, you know, Intel is unusual in its at least historical ability to afford investment across the spectrum. And so if you look at uh, companies like um, like uh, Broadcom is a good example. I'll, I'll use, I have no confidential information about Broadcom. Broadcom specifically says we're not going to do the top three. Right, because we're certainly not going to build a fab. Uh, we don't want to bet on our, our ability to augment the process, and we don't have to because we can buy that stuff on the outside. We're a big enough consumer. Um, we're going to try to develop some horizontal technology, but we're not going to necessarily organize ourselves in a way that we have to, so we're just going to focus on how can we uh, be good procurers of all of those other levels and, and add value there. TSMC, right, uh, is and baseline process, they're working on technologies to try to augment the process, but they've gotten very smart. And they've said, we can't invent everything. And so we need to, to view our baseline process as a platform for guys that are doing process augmentation to sit on top and use our, you, you know, the, 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 if, if every augmented process runs on a TSMC baseline process, we win whether we invented that augmentation or not. So, so they've said, we're just going to focus on the iron. We're not going to do nothing in those other areas, but that's where our value gets created. So I think, in general, you know, companies will sort into one of those tiers. Yes? I have a question just about the venture capital industry in general. So, so with this, um, this economic downturn, do you think there's going to be a lot of uh, downsizing in the venture capital industry as well? Uh, or? I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think the venture capital business is at least a few times too big and possibly more. I said that I think semiconductor venture capital, uh, semiconductor venture capital is five times bigger, could be more. So I am hoping that finally uh, the adverse economic uh, climate will cause people to think long and hard about venture returns and the venture industry will fall by, you know, some interesting integral factor. Micro brews in what way? In the sense that you used to have, you, you, you build your own little brew pub and brew it in the thing, then they started doing the craft brewing at, at places like Budweiser. Uh, and so, you know, with specialized recipes or not. Well, that's what happened when the, the, when the, the brewing business became fabulous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the good thing about, about beer, though, is that. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.